Hi, I'm Christine Jacobs Wagner. I am the director of the Microbial Sciences Institute at Yale University. I am also a professor of molecular cellular environmental biology and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. In this presentation, I would like to tell you about the cell biology of bacteria. And in particular, I would like to, I hope to convince you that the spatial organization of bacterial cells is remarkably uh, complex. And this sophisticated spatial organization is very important for the behavior and the, and, uh, and the function of the cell. So as you all probably all know, uh, bacteria are everywhere, and they have a tremendous impact on everything that we care about. So starting with our health, also our environment, our agriculture, and many aspects of our industry. And so it is very important for us to study bacteria. Now, bacteria are also the most abundant life form on this planet, and they are absolutely essential for sustaining life, any life on this, uh, on this Earth. And this is remarkable considering that we cannot even see them. We cannot see them, they're invisible to us because they are very small. They are not only small because, unlike complex organisms like ourselves, they're typically made of a single cell, but also because they are very, the bacterial cell itself is very small relative to most animal cells. And so um, they have a big difference between eukaryotic cells. There is a big difference between eukaryotic cells and bacterial cells in terms of size. But there is another difference in terms of cellular organization. So if you were to slice open through a bacterial cell, and through an animal cells, like our cells, you will see a big difference if you were imaging by electron microscopy. So this is illustrated here. So in the bottom, you have a typical eukaryotic cells. And as you can see, the cytoplasm is compartmentalized because there are membrane and closed organelles, such as the nucleus, mitochondria, ER, and Golgi. The bacterial cells, uh, relatively speaking, is far more simpler. It's far more simple. So it's made of a cytoplasmic membrane that is surrounded by a cell wall, and then inside the cytoplasm, there's pretty much everything. There is the DNA, the ribosome, the protein, the metabolites, all in one single uh, compartment. So in that respect, they are simpler. But in addition, it's been known for years that the eukaryotic cells has an elaborate cytoskeleton, and also they can have sophisticated spatial patterning in which molecules are localized to specific location inside the cells. Uh, exhibiting cell polarity and complex spatial patterning as shown here. Well, this was thought to be unique to eukaryotic cells. Bacterial cells were pictured or perceived as tiny little bags full of biomolecules just floating around with no uh, uh, spatial organization. Well, that turned out to be incorrect. Within the last decade or so, there's been a big revolution in microbiology with the realization that bacterial cells do exhibit spatial organization, but uh, only at the molecular level. So for one, they do have a cytoskeleton. Actually, they invented it. And also, they can exhibit the intricate spatial patterning, including uh, cell polarization. So there's been a lot of evidence in, uh, in recent years. I won't have time to describe all of this evidence. And so therefore, I'm just going to describe a few examples that I think illustrate the point. So starting with the cytoskeleton. So we know that in our cells, there are three major cytoskeletal systems. So microtubules made of tubulin, microfilaments made of actin, and intermediate filament, uh, filament made of intermediate filament protein. Well, now we know that we can find in the bacterial world counterpart to all three types of cytoskeletal system. So let's start with the tubulin homolog in bacteria. This is the FTSZ. So FTSZ, as I'll show you in a minute, is a very important protein in bacteria. It's virtually found in all bacteria because it's absolutely essential for cell division. As shown in this, um, in this image here, this is the crystal structure of FTSZ, of the bacterial protein, the tubulin homolog, and here on uh, the crystal structure of the eukaryotic uh, tubulin. And while the at the protein sequence level, there is similarity, but it's not incredibly striking. At the, um, at the structural level, there is really beautiful similarity. Now, there is no question in the field, it is widely accepted that the bacterial uh, FTSZ protein and the eukaryotic uh, tubulins have evolved from a common bacterial ancestor. And so what it means is that during evolution, the protein sequence has uh, changed a lot, but at the structural level, uh, it has changed uh, not as much. Okay, so uh, FTSZ, uh, if you purify it, 
in vitro, it's going to polymerize if you put it in the presence of GTP. And so this is shown here. So this is in vitro with purified proteins. But inside the cells, FTSE is also going to form filamentous structure. And these filamentous structures are going to associate underneath the cell membrane to form on those beautiful rings that are shown here by perforescence microscopy. So this is looking at a cross-section uh, of the cell. So this is how it would look like in a schematic. And this is because FTSE filaments are going to arrange to form a ring structure, which we call the FTSE ring. And they're going to specifically form at the side of the vision. And the reason is because this ring is going to be important for the cytokinesis process, so for dividing the cell. So this is shown here in this movie. In this movie now, we're looking at FTSZ uh, by fluorescence microscopy because FTSZ has been tagged by a fluorescent uh, protein, the yellow fluorescent protein. So it appears um, here as it being a pseudo color yellow. And now the FTSZ ring appears as a band or two dots. And the reason is because it's as if you were looking at the ring uh, uh, from the top or from the bottom. So as the cells grow, this FTSE ring is going to constrict or condense, and that's going to promote cell wall synthesis across, um, along the cell, the cell width, resulting in the formation of new cell poles. So what you can do by genetic engineering, you can deplete the cell of FTSE. And this is what we did in this experiment. And what you're seeing here is now cells that are growing in the absence of FTSE. Now, they can still elongate just fine, but they can no longer divide. And therefore, now the cells are going to form those long filaments that eventually are going to die. So many bacteria have a tubulin homolog called FTSZ. Now, many bacteria also have an actin homolog that is known as MRIB. And so it's the same story. Just like FTSZ, MRIB was discovered many years ago. But at the protein sequence level, the similarity with actin was uh, uh, there is some similarity, but it's not incredibly apparent. But at the, stru at the, um, at the structural level, the similarity between uh, MRIB and actin is really striking. So here you're seeing an atomic model of the MRIB protofilaments and F-actin. So if you purify MRIB and incubate it in the presence of ATP, it's going to form those really nice filaments. And inside the cell, which is shown here, uh, MRIB is also going to form uh, short filaments that are going to be just beneath the cell membrane along the cell body that appears here as those little patches. And these little patches are actually rotating across the circumference of the cell. And they are in a complex with cell wall enzyme. And so thereby, cell wall synthesis is going to be guided along the circumference of the cells. And this is going to be important for the elongation process. So this is an E. coli cell. And this E. coli cell, in addition of dividing, before dividing, it has to elongate. So, and when it elongates, its width remains constant. And this is important. And this is mediated by uh, uh, MRIB. But if you inhibit MRIB activity, so you can do this by adding drugs that affect its polymerization process, now the cells still grow. But now cell wall synthesis is disorganized, such that now the cells are going to get fatter and fatter and fatter until uh, they became round, and then they're going to die. Presumably because they are too fat, too wide, to allow the polymerization of the FTSZ ring, and therefore they cannot divide. So you have uh, some bacteria have actin homolog, in particular the rod-shaped bacteria that have to elongate. Uh, spherical bacteria tend to not have MRIB because they don't have this elongation process. But then some bacteria also have uh, intermediate filament protein. And so here, what I'm showing is intermediate filament proteins uh, that I found in our cells. So it's an example of vimentin, uh, keratin, lamin. And they all have this uh, domain organization made of four core, core forming segments, shown in green, that are separated by short length curves. And you also have a head and a tail domain that vary in size and composition. Now, the first bacterial intermediate filament protein, uh, the first intermediate filament-like protein found in bacteria is crescentin. And this protein was found in Colobacter crescentus. And again, it has the same structural organization. If it has a similar biochemical property of animal intermediate filament protein, and, and the striking one is the fact that 
If you put a phycrocentin in vitro, it's going to spontaneously self-assemble into those beautiful filaments that look like intermediate filaments uh, shown here by electron microscopy. And it does that without having to, in, in the absence of cofactor or nucleotide. Now, inside a cell, crescentin is also going to form filaments. And what's really neat is that it's going to form those filaments just at the, on one side of the cells. And it's always the side of the inner curvature. So Colobacter crescentus got his name crescentus because it has a crescent shape. So it means that uh, it has this gentle curvature. And this is actually mediated by this protein crescentin that forms a filamental structure here shown in pink on one side of the cells, the side of the inner curvature. OK, so when the cells do not have crescentin, so if we delete the genes that encode for crescentin, now the cells lose the curvature and become straight rod, as shown in this image. And it has been shown that the, cell, the curvature of Colobacter crescentus is important for surface adhesion in natural habitats. So this is what happens when you don't have crescentin. But now you can, if you overproduce crescentin, so if, if the cell has too much crescentin, then what happens now, you accentuate the curvature of the cell. And now the cell looks like bagels. And now if for fun, you overproduce crescentin, and you also block cell division. Now the cells are going to filament into those tightly coiled cells that look like a telephone cord. And so then there is a lot of a big body of work that suggests that the way that crescentin filaments affect cell curvature is by mechanically affecting the way that the cells grow. Now Colobacter has Colobacter crescentus as crescentin is important for cell curvature. But then there's other bacteria that have other intermediate filament-like protein that are important for other mechanical function. And this is reminiscent to all the intermediate filament protein that are in our, in our cells that are also important for different mechanical function. And so another example of intermediate filament protein in bacteria that was uh, well studied is field P. So field P is found in Streptomyces species. It's, and here this is shown in Streptomyces silicolor that forms those very long cell filaments. And field P here is shown in yellow. And it forms those filaments to structure inside the cells. And what was shown by atomic force microscopy is that those field P filaments are important, or at least contribute to the mechanical strength of the cell. So without field P, the cells are not mechanically uh, uh, as strong, as, uh, as fit. And this is really reminiscent to our uh, intermediate filament in our, in our cells, in our skin cells, that are important for the mechanical strength of those cells. All right, so I gave you example of um, tubulin homolog, FTSZ, in bacteria there is acting homolog, I, sh I show you MRB, which is the most famous one, but there is others. And then there is uh, intermediate filament protein that are important for a variety of cytoskeletal function. But what's more is that we now know that there are other bacterial cytoskeletal protein, and probably the most famous one is bactophilins. And these also are important for uh, cytoskeletal function in a variety of bacterial species. And they are unique to bacteria. They are not found in eukaryotic cells. So as you can see, there is really a richness in terms of cytoskeletal elements in bacteria. But bacteria also exhibit cell polarity. Now, in some bacteria, uh, this cell polarity is actually seen at the morphological level. So my favorite example, of course, is a bacterium that is dear to my heart, called the bactocrescensus, that, as you can see in this electron micrograph, exhibit a lot of cellular asymmetry because it has a flagellum in one end of the cells. It has an appendage, which we call a stalk, at the other end of the cells. This appendage is basically a cell extent, uh, uh, an extension of the cell envelope. And this is going to increase the surface to volume ratio of the cell, so increase uh, the amount of membrane and increasing thereby uh, nutrient transport. And if actually, if you pay attention, division is also asymmetric, unequal in, in Colobacter, producing a daughter cell that is a little bit shorter than the other daughter cell. So a lot of cellular asymmetry. Now, in most bacteria, um, cell polarity is actually not seen at the, morphological uh, at the morphological level, but it's seen at the molecular level. And that is because there are proteins that accumulate at the end of the cells, which we call the cell poles. A prime example. The first example is chemoreceptor. 
Now, chemo receptors, which is shown by fluorescent microscopy here, accumulates at both ends of here E. coli cells, but it has been shown also to accumulate at the ends of many bacteria. So what chemo, chemo receptors are is that these are the proteins that sense the environment and allow bacteria that can swim to swim towards things that they like and to swim away from things they don't like. There is many other examples of protein that accumulate at the, at the, at the end of the cells. Uh, we, we talk about polar localization. So there is a lot of protein, po the polar protein localization. Another example, which is here in Colobacter crescentus, is this protein in red, which is PubZ, again looking at by fluorescence microscopy. This protein accumulates at both ends of the cells and is going to achieve a lot of polar, uh, polarized function there. One that is shown in this, um, in, this, um, in this image is that in green you have the DNA, so those are the chromosome. The chromosome has been duplicated and PubZ is actually tethering the chromosome at the end of the cells because it can interact, it, it can interact indirectly with the DNA sequence and thereby tethering uh, the, the, the duplicated chromosome at opposite ends. Okay, so what I showed you previously is protein that accumulate at both ends of the cells. But there is also protein that can do better than that. They can actually recognize one end of the cells from the other. And so this is an example, again, in Colobacter crescentus, which divides asymmetrically. And in, in, the, in Colobacter, it's going to produce, Colobacter, when it divides, it's going to produce two daughter cells that have a different cell fate. So here is this, what we call the swarmer cell and then the stalk cells. This is in part mediating because of the asymmetric localization of signal transduction protein. So sh and an example is shown here. So here you see this is, um, this is a predivisional cell, and in blue you have a kinase accumulating at one end of the cells, and in red you have a phosphatase accumulating at the opposite end of the cell. Now this phosphatase and kinase, which have opposing activity, Actually, they have opposing activity on the same regulator, so the same substrate. And this regulator, whether it is phosphorylated or not, it's going to be able to um, turn on gene expression or not. Now, in the mother cell, so in the predivisional cells, you have the kinase on one end, the phosphatase at the other end, and the kinase is winning. And therefore, that regulator is phosphorylated, and, and you have a certain uh, program of gene expression. But when division occurs, immediately after cell division occurs, now you see one of the daughter cells are going to inherit only the phosphatase because of this asymmetric localization. And now the regulator is going to be unphosphorylated. Whereas in the other daughter cells, which is inheriting only the kinase, now the regulator is going to be phosphorylated. And therefore, you're going to have a different program of gene expression between those two daughter cells, and therefore a different cell fate because of this asymmetric localization. Um, of, of protein, of signal destruction protein. Now, um, asymmetric localization of protein is not only seen in asymmetrically dividing bacteria. It's all, it can also be seen in bacteria that divide symmetrically, and it can play a very important function. Um, some of my favorite example is the polar localization of virulence factors in Shigella and Listeria species. So in this two human pathogen, there is, two, there is a protein called ICSA in Shigella and ACT-A in Listeria. And these proteins are surface exposed, so they face the environment, but they are expressed or they are localized specifically on one side of the cells. And this is shown in the schematic, and this is shown in this electron micrograph here, uh, where ICSA has been localized shown in Shigella, but you would see the same thing for Act A in Listeria. So you can see that it accumulates at one end of the cell. And this is important because when this pathogen is in the eukaryotic cells, this protein shown in red in the schematic is going to recruit the eukaryotic, so the host actin. And by doing so, it's going to create those actin tail. Okay, so we're going to have polarization and depolarization of acting on one side of the cells, and this is going to allow the cell, the bacteria cells, to, um, to move. So you're going to have actin-based motility. And this is important for the bacteria cells, because now the bacteria cells is going to be able to move in the cytoplasm of the eukaryotic cell, 
and this is shown in the static image here. In the um, in green is actin, and in red is the bacteria. So first of all, you can see the outline of the eukaryotic cells, and you can see that the bacteria cells, this tiny little red dot. You can see how sm much smaller they are uh, com in comparison to eukaryotic cells. Now at the back of the little bacteria cells, you see those actin tail. Well, this is go what's going to promote those bacteria to move into the eukaryotic cytoplasm. But they're going, it's going to also allow them to escape from the eukaryotic cells. And this is shown in the schematic. Um, what you see is that the bacteria cells, through this actin-based motility, is going to be able to move into another, a neighboring cell. And thereby, it's going to be able to colonize the tissue without being exposed to the extracellular milieu where uh, it could be attacked by the immune system. So those are a few examples of polar localization of proteins, which is important for a variety of function. Now, those patterns can be even more intricate than that. And this is really a nice example. This is uh, the localization of a protein called MIND in, um, in E. coli. But this, this protein also exists in other bacteria. What you see here is, again, elect uh, for instance, microscopy in white is the MIND protein that has been first labeled so that we can visualize it. And so it accumulates on one side of the cells. The outline of the cells is shown in green. But what's amazing as I start the movie is that as you can see this localization is very dynamic. So the protein oscillates from one end of the cells to the other in tens of seconds. This is important for the cells for this reason, because MIND oscillate through a very simple biochemical reaction that I don't have time to describe, but it's also associated with another protein called MIND-C. And therefore, MIND-C, together by being complex with MIND-D, is basically oscillating from one end of the cells to the other. Now, this MIND-C protein is, in fact, an inhibitor of our cell division. It does that by inhibiting the polarization of the FTSZ um, uh, uh, tubulin homologue. So because you have this oscillation from one end of the cells to the other, it means that on time average, the lowest concentration of that MIND-C inhibitor of FTIZ ring polymerization is actually in the middle. And that is going to help the cells to determine where the middle of the cells is. Because now FTIZ ring uh, assembly is only going to be able to form where there is the lowest concentration of that MIND-C inhibitors, which is right in the middle of the cells because of this very dynamic protein localization pattern. All right, so I've shown you that bacteria have cytoskeletal elements. They also uh, exhibit spatial patterning and cell polarity. But there is another element of spatial organization in the bacteria cells, and that is uh, mediated by the chromosome. OK, so bacteria. Typically, they have one or two, but the, most of them have one cir uh, circular chromosome that is going to be packaged by inside the bacteria cell by being condensed about a thousand fold. All right, so it has to be folded, but it is folded in a very organized fashion, such that so here the DNA is shown in blue, such that uh, each gene is going to be located at a, at a location inside the cells that is predictable and conserved across cells at the same cell cycle stage. OK, so this has been shown in many bacterial models. I'm, showing, I'm going to show you the case of Colobacter crescentus. So in Colobacter crescentus, so this is a chromosome of Colobacter crescentus. And it has a typical uh, circular chromosome, like many bacteria, with a single origin and the terminus at the opposite end. Now what was done in Colobacter is that what is shown here is that over 100 locations along the chromosome were localized inside the cells by, for instance, microscopy. And it was shown that, uh, that the arrangement of those genes inside the cells follow, follow a linear arrangement, such that the origin of replication was always found at that one end of the cells, whereas the terminus was found at the opposite end. And then if I randomly take this region 1 and 2 on each side of the chromosome, they would be located roughly here, and 3 and 4 would be located there, and anything in between on the chromosome, chromosomal map would be located in between inside the cells. This is actually important because 
uh, in Bactiara, there was no nuclear envelope. And therefore, when transcription starts, translation starts as well. So this is unlike in, um, in eukaryotic cells, where transcription and translation are separated in time. And so it means that since each gene is going to be located at a predictable and conserved region inside the cells, it means that the protein that is encoded by that gene is going to be made also at that location. OK, so I hope that I've convinced you that bacteria exhibit a sophisticated spatial organization that is really important for many aspects of cellular function and, uh, and cellular behavior. And it is clear that we are only seeing the tip of the iceberg. And so there is many discovery uh, that still has to be made. And this is going to be greatly facilit facilitated by the fact that there has been a lot of advances in microscopy and microscopy-related technique in recent years. So starting with single molecule versus microscopy technique and super resolution uh, versus microscopy technique, which is very important because this is increasing the spatial resolution at which we can see things. And for bacteria cells that are very tiny, this is very important. But there is also advances in microfluidics, in image analysis, and of course, cryo electron microscopy, such as cryo uh, tomography. So certainly, it's going to be very exciting uh, to study uh, the cell biology uh, of bacteria in the future. So to just finish, I would like to acknowledge, of course, all the bacterial cell biology labs across the world. Um, I would like to thank past and current member of my lab. In particular, I would like to thank Jennifer Heinrichs, who helped me uh, produce some of the movie that I presented in this presentation. And of course, a big thank uh, to the funding agency that support research in bacterial cell biology. And thank you um, for your attention.